what's mission prep? Tell me what, what that's all about. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> it's over. Edit this out. We're Edit done. This shit up. But so cool. Today we have the creator of our logo, which was awesome of her. Uh, she's done an art piece for us. If you watch YouTube or follow our Instagram, you've seen it. Mm-hmm. And she is the owner of JM Artworks Studio. Yeah, J Mart works. <laughs> that, that's the, the I Instagram. did studio. Yeah. So yeah, Jess Musgrave, right? Yeah. All right. So she traveled all the way from Austin, Texas, to Boise, and she's doing a couple things while she's in town. Here she is. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Of course. So, what do you think about Boise? I love it. That's uh, it's like strikingly beautiful. <clears throat> it is. It is. We take it for granted, I think, because we're always here. Yeah. And yeah. plus everyone that comes here always mentions like how clean the city is. You know, yes. like, that's where taxes are going. You know, we have obviously Idaho has a lottery. Not that every town in Idaho is that clean, but for the most part they are, you know. Um, you know, we keep the white trash people at bay. <laughs> or we put them in certain parts of town where no one can see them. Those dirty fuckers. Uh, you know, we, yeah. we did have we had a homeless problem for a few years. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they were gone. Oh, so it's crazy it, about Austin yeah. right now. It wasn't all of a sudden. It was around the skate park. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, it made it kind of. I get it. a lot of people empathize with them, and I kind of see, kind of see on both sides too. They basically just under the bridge built a bunch of shit so people couldn't sleep on it. It was like awkwardly shaped concrete and rocks. Yes, yeah. really. Because there's a there's a it's a big skate park around here. It's been here forever, and it's under an overpass. And so that's where the homeless people would congregate. It was under there, and it was a weird dynamic because you have a kid skateboarding. And then a bunch of homeless people that are either on drugs or mentally ill or whatever. Yeah. And they would harass people. You'd drive through there and they'd come up and ask for money and harass and harass. And then, like he said, they started, they put like these sharp boulders and shit all where they would hang out. And also like a bunch of artwork, like abstract mm-hmm. looking artwork that's sculptures and yeah, stuff and stuff you're not going to be laying on. Yeah. And, but they pushed them out, but I don't know where they all went. Like, I don't know if they brought a bus in and said, here, here's a ticket, go. I don't I don't know. I mean, I know that Texas is trying to do something right now with cleaning, cleaning that up. But like even my favorite art store, like where I get more most of my supplies, it's um, on Airport Road. And it's just it's literally tent city, Mm. you know, and I'm fine um, as long as you're not coming up behind me, mm-hmm. especially when I have my kids with me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's happened a few times, but you know, we used to, before COVID, we used to um, collect coats and I do like a care package every Christmas. And mm-hmm. like people don't think about it, but like women need lady supplies. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we used to, we used to do that, but now it's, um, it's, it feels different. Mm-hmm. it's i don't want to say evasive but it's a lot well i've seen some people that i follow online that live in austin post about the homeless issues and like how it's getting out of control yeah and i think you get that with the growing city too unfortunately because you get people coming that end up not being able to afford to live there like they might have planned on maybe right. but yeah it's sad because I, I like i told you when i went to austin that was 2016 i think it wasn't that bad. No, it really wasn't. I, I remember thinking, wow, for such a big city, this is a really clean place. It reminded me of like a bigger Boise. Yeah. And I've heard it's not that way anymore. It's not. And I don't, I think there's a mel- mental health aspect to it. Yeah. Um, like resources. It's hard to live in Austin. Like it's expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, I've last person who she, she told me she was homeless. I didn't assume you know, she was like, I just lost my job because of COVID and okay, mm-hmm. we'll work it out. You know, sometimes it's just like, what can I do? Can I give you a cup of coffee or some food? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I know that there's somewhere near the airport and I haven't looked into it, but it's um, like a tiny home village where people who want to live tiny can have a tiny home there. But then part of it is like, it's almost like a co-op 
where if you're homeless, they give you shelter, but everyone works like in the garden or something. Mm, I've, I've, um, I've heard of places like that. Yeah. So I, that's like a mystery to me because I haven't researched it, but mm -hmm. that's, yeah. you know, that'd it's, be cool to see that. It's sad because I think a lot of it is mental illness. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I don't think you can help some of those people. They don't want the help. Well, yeah. Because we have to be willing. Yeah, yeah. Because when you're paying, I mean, I know every state has this, but you're paying taxes like we do, like the amount we pay in Boise or in the Boise area is a lot of it's for that because they help people. Like mm -hmm. how many people live here that don't work and that have like four kids or the kids are taken away because the cops, you know, were called in and there was shit all over their house because they mm -hmm. were neglecting their children right yeah there's still programs for them what is it called section seven section eight something like that it's like section, like eight at, section eight in, yeah yeah, yeah. Low so low income yeah so yeah. i mean you have those for those people so when you see people not taking advantage of that you know like there may be they may be might be mentally ill or feel ashamed too ashamed to reach out for the help yeah because it's there for mm -hmm. them you know like they have their like my mother worked for child uh health and welfare and so she was one of the ones, like she had like two different jobs there. She was really good at her job. One of them was writing checks for the car, for refugees and those people as well. So refugees as well, by the way, were paying for lot, their vehicles are driving on those vans, wherever they have the four Tauruses, they write the checks for the payments for the vehicle to give it to them and their monthly checks for their stipend. Mm -hmm. I mean, so mm -hmm. the opportunity is there for everybody here. Refugees, uh, you know, people that are homeless. It's just, if they can't reach out, who's their advocate, who's going to walk down the street and be like, Hey, I can get you somewhere right now. Can yeah. you go do it? And maybe they're not accepting of it, you know, because well, they're too yeah. ashamed or. I know there's a, it's like a shelter downtown called the Interfaith Sanctuary. Uh -huh. Yep. And they had a problem with tents. It became like a tent city around that. And it was so bad. I mean, you'd be heading into downtown and that's all you would see on the right hand side was just tents. I'm like, where did it, where do the tents come from? Uh, I don't it's know. It's not REI. <laughs> yeah. well, and I know that they put like a camping ban here which okay. some people were against and which i kind of get because they're saying no it's inhumane let these people have some shelter but boise does offer a lot of shelter and i i'm not that educated on our homeless situation but i from what i heard they put a, the camping ban in place because all the tents are gone right now well okay. people see things at face value and they react yeah just like they do in, in politics especially young people that are ignorant to the under the workings of the ec economy in the world in general mm -hmm. it's like no there is things in place for them that's why we pay our taxes educate yourself before you make wild comments about like how you know like oh we're so fat because there was comments when they're doing that like oh the police are so fascist here it's like they're doing what they're told and because there are, there are any programs in place if there wasn't programs in place then they might be more lenient about that but since they're there it's like hey you have these options if you don't want them get the fuck out mm -hmm. okay at the end of the day we can't just nurture everybody you have to have that masculine energy sometimes tell you to fucking do something or get the fuck out. Well, it's okay you to know? have sympathy for those people as well. As, Absolutely. But you also can't have people like doing drugs openly in the streets some, and well, stuff like that. Well, people aren't used to boundaries yeah. Yeah. with anything. So yeah, it's, un it's an unfortunate situation. But Boise did something to like get rid of the I problem. I mean, I noticed not... it because you know, I'm staying downtown. Yeah. I noticed it the second I was on. Mm -hmm. Was that Capitol? Yeah. Yeah. Capitol Boulevard. That's not what South Congress looks like for us, uh, yeah. you know? Which is crazy to hear because when I was there, that's where we stayed right off of, it was off South Congress and I don't remember, but it was, a, we got an Airbnb. Yeah. It was like a loft right there and it was so clean. It was amazing. It was like five minutes to walk to the Capitol where we were staying. Yeah. I feel like if they work together and do some stuff, then there's, there's, there's so many programs. Like I know from Fort Worth, I used to work at a program or not work. I volunteer. It was called Hope Farm. And it was like inner city work. It's men working with boys mm. specifically. So it's like, there's, there's so many programs like this, like, okay, you don't have a father figure. Let's find that you don't have shelter. Let's find a program that works with that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like, but, oh, yeah, I just know. I just know. I don't feel comfortable when I'm like I'm fine usually when it's myself, but with my kids because I have I'm different. like on a high alert because I've had a few times where they've someone's come up behind me. Yeah, and that's just not. Well, and having your kids with you, it puts it's like a whole nother level. Yeah, I'm, especially uh, a four year old because they can do whatever the yeah. hell they want to do. Yeah, I'm the know, same when I have my bullet. kids with me. Yeah, it's like no matter how empathetic you can be. 
it's like when your kids are involved, it's like, you got to turn that fight or flight on. Yeah. It's just, it's, you can't, I mean, you can't help it really. It's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, get the fuck away from me. Create space, create a boundary and create a distance. Um, because it's so much different, you know, you don't have that luxury of just being self-absorbed and just being like a free spirit. Like, Oh, it's cool, man. Yeah. You want some beef jerky? It's like when your kids are involved, it's like, get the fuck away from me. You know, yeah. when I'm by myself, I'll do something, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll fucking kill somebody for my kids. Yeah. And that's not, I'm not exaggerating, you know? Well, it's and so it's, innate, like even positioning, if they're beside me, someone's coming up behind me, I'm going to put myself in between already and start, mm-hmm. you know, like there's, there's things that I've heard, like having a, a secret word or something within your family mm-hmm. for a dangerous situation. Um, like I wasn't. I don't know. We've talked about it just recently. It was um, creating a safety plan with the kids. Like, Hey, if there's a fire, where do you go? Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that a four-year-old and a seven-year-old should definitely know. Yeah. Um, But I think that there's a lot of like, we get narrowed vision. So in a situation like that spooks you, you're like, okay, I'm not as prepared as I thought. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, well, so I guess now, you know, I'm a mom of two. Yes. Yes. That's, um, it's which for you listening, we, we actually met last night with, with Jess and had a, had some drinks and had a good conversation. And we were telling her that she's been like a mystery to us Yeah, because <laughs> we've been just interacting online and you've been fucking amazing to us, whether it's the artwork that's hanging in here or our fucking logo, which is awesome. Uh, thanks. And, I mean, well, don't... I mean, like. I, that's the thing that we've talked about this on here a few times, but we, we keep meeting really good people and you're one of them. Like you didn't need to do anything for us. You don't even really know us, but you yeah. did. And I mean, you've told me a few times, like I believe in you guys and stuff like that. Yeah. That means a lot. Well, it's cause you're cultivating. And I, I recognize when someone's cultivating or when they're sitting stagnant and um, that's something like with my art page, that kind of a, somewhat of a mystery. Um, but it's because I want the focus to be more on mm-hmm. my artwork and my process and hopefully to inspire someone to be like, okay, what are you good at? You're good at music. Let's, let's see you work on that. Mm-hmm. You guys are cultivating the podcast. And I, I saw it um, coming together. Like every episode is just fine tuning. And I see that in my own um, artwork. Mm-hmm. So immediately I'll be the biggest cheerleader for anyone. Some people need that cheerleader. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's like a natural. It's motivating for sure. Like, like just the things you've said to me online, like saying like, I believe in what you guys are doing and all that. It's like, fuck yeah. Like that gives me more fire to just keep going. Yeah. And we've, we've had a few other people like that as well. That have been really cool Mm -hmm. about that, but absolutely. But yeah. So I guess let's talk about how you got into art because your art is amazing and that's the other thing like i think when we first started talking you had said yeah if you go back and look at my earlier stuff it's not as good as it is now yeah and i did go i went on your website and looked and you're right like you just keep getting better and better and better and then your most recent one that thanos you did oh oh my god like yeah i would i actually want to like a in a sense of play-by-play from why you started your page Mm -hmm. and then that shift you made from going into the uh i don't know what you call it i guess the the black backgrounds yeah made like it was like a out of nowhere it's just like boom switched it up and immediately caught my eye Me too. because i like wearing black clothes except for today and i like black <laughs> things in general I like black ninjas so like as soon as he went to black i was like that's the shit i'm into i was immediately into it yeah. you know so like yeah i guess why'd you start the page and then what was that transition so i've I've always been drawn to art or being creative. My mom's super creative. Um, She doesn't paint or draw or anything like that. She just, you know, like my grandmother was a seamstress like on fifth street. So she's, she, and she used to write. So there's always been something in my family that's like um, creative and cultivating creativity, but the art for me changed in my maybe early twenties. I did acrylic work there. I won't post any of that. I might, I might just to be yeah, like, this yeah, is what I used to do. Yeah. Um, but really it was just an outlet. And then if you go, what the reason I started my page was because I wanted to do prints and I 
was like doing watercolors at the time. And that was kind of like what was trending. But then I, I love that I've left that on there because you can see when I finally found my voice as an artist and it was like, okay, I just found my stride, you know? And, um, what I noticed was I was trying to be like everyone else that was growing their Instagram or whatever. And I just wanted to make a little bit of side money for my family. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was working mainly with watercolors and they're cute, but that's not like that might be fun just to sit and do with the kids now. Mm. Um, but this for me, like all my black and white stuff, it's, that is me. That's my voice. Like I, I know without a doubt, that's my gift. That's how I see things, but it was like trial by error. And the, the reason it came up is because I do a lot of work for foundations and stuff. I, for like, I, I make money, but I don't make money. Mm. It's not consistent. When I get a great client, I'm so grateful. Um, but it's not, I don't want to be peddling artwork. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a hobby that when it pays well, I'm grateful for it, but I always feel like if that's a gift and I'm, it's my job to fine tune it and then to use it to help better um, someone like the way that my black and white stuff came up was I was uh, working with a group of power athlete. I was working with power athlete. Um, Kate runs Wade's army and um, they needed fun. They needed a fundraiser. So uh, we talked, I was going to paint this angel. I tried to do it in watercolors and it just didn't fit. Um, so I, I was like, well, I'll give acrylics a try again. Cause I hadn't used acrylics in years. Well, I did that. I worked on the face of the angel for like four hours and a total mom moment stepped away to fold laundry. It was less than 30 seconds. My two-year-old was with me at the time. And then he was gone for like 30 seconds. And I'm like, where'd he go? And I walk out and that portrait that I had worked on for four hours, just trying to um, shape a face, he had taken black paint and just smeared it across. I mean, <laughs> perfectly smeared it across the face where I couldn't save it. Like there was, I looked at it and it was like clumpy, you know, cause he just, just took like a chunk of paint all mm. over. Uh, so in like my normal fashion, I just like started crying and I couldn't look at it for a few days. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to work with that? And the only way to fix it was to paint the canvas black and then go back, like just restart, but go instead of doing the white on, um, or the black on white, flip it and it'd be white on black. Mm. And, um, that's what worked. I ended up doing that angel and, that came at a time in my life where it was significant for me. Like it just, it, paintings tend to line up with whatever I'm going through. What I mean, even like commission pieces. Um, so it's not my idea, but whatever I'm going through, it somehow like gels into that commission piece. So that angel came at a perfect time. And um, then we ended up doing a lion for them. And if you go back, uh, I posted the picture where my son had painted that face because mm. it was like a, a pivotal moment for me, um, like a beautiful mistake. And that's something that I, I still hold on to, you know, when things are looking really rough and maybe it looks like a pile of shit. Well, it's like, it's okay. I can, mm. I can work with that because I have that experience kind of in the back of my mind of um, maybe it looks like, um, Maybe it looks like pain or maybe it looks like, um, like a giant mistake, but there's purpose in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we were saying last night, there's purpose in pain. Yeah. 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 Or any, anything like that. Like that's like a theme of the damn podcast. And we talk about it's almost every podcast now, Yeah. but hard times, struggle, all that stuff. Yeah. It's beautiful. Things can come out of well, that. Yeah. Is your best art going to come from? Like if you just imagine like a trail, or like a, I don't know, four foot wide path, right? If you're walking down it and you're walking everybody else's footprints, 
is that going to create an artistic view or taking anyone no one's been on yet? You don't know where it's going. You don't know how bad it's going to be, but or, you do it. Good. So that fear that everything you have to overcome on that path is going to make you different. It's going to change your perspective. You know, um, like I know when we write music in our band, we write the best music when we're going through shit, mm-hmm. you know, we're like at times we're trying not to just go Kerouac in everyone's ass, you know, like <laughs> that's where we write our best music. Mm-hmm. And then those in-between spots where we're not really doing anything different or going through struggle. It's kind of just like, we just like are constantly trying to fine tune certain songs. And it's like, we don't like it. You know, we put a lot of time in this one song and it's just not going anywhere. It's like, let's go uh, starve ourselves and go fucking, you know, do a rock march or something, you know, up some trails or whatever, or anything, you know, or go through some emotional stress. Yeah, I don't think you're going to get a lot out of taking the path everyone else has taken. You're just, you know, it's going to be easy. You know, you're going to get somewhere. You're going to be complacent because you know, it's going to be safe, Mm -hmm. but it's the other path one's been on. That's going to create a different perspective, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, uniqueness. Yeah. Like, I mean, you look at your art compared to somebody who just does water, which people, there's a lot of people do watercolors and I'm sure they're amazing, but you look at what you're doing now compared to what you were doing before. It is so unique. Yeah. Like your art it stands out big thank time. you and i've 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 shown your art to so many fucking people i really have <laughs> like people at work or whatever really? i'm like, thank I'm like you. i'll pull you up your instagram I'm like dude check this stuff out because it's it's weird because like growing up and stuff i had artists in my family but i never had an appreciation for art i really didn't mm-hmm. and as i've gotten older i've started to get an appreciation for it and i think i had told you that i messaged you i was like when you make these posts like it makes me happy seeing your work yeah and i've just gotten more of an appreciation for it i never had that talent like to paint or draw or anything i can barely draw stick figures but i really appreciate someone who can and like my grandmother was a really good painter and i never i kind of took it for granted i'm like oh that's cool someone can do that but there was no appreciation there yeah but as i get older it's I have much more of an appreciation for art well and i'm starting to understand my aesthetic and like okay if I can add a little bit of color, what does that look like? You mm-hmm. know, cause it still needs to look like that's a perfect example. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it needed a little bit of color, Yeah. Uh, but it still looks like my mm-hmm. artwork. And, you know, one of the things, ugh, this was random. I found out um, someone got one of my lions tattooed on their arms, which was really cool. Mm-hmm. And then that Deadpool, yeah. mm-hmm. someone is, has i'm trying to track this person down but it's i've heard it from two people now that he was or has um tattooed that deadpool i'm not gonna lie i him. i really thought about that <laughs> the painting you did for us i'm like that would be an amazing tattoo because i've been thinking about getting the other arm done and i'm like oh that'd be kind of cool i saw a really cool s- tattoo of him um but it was like it looked like he was coming forward but the um the clock is like part of his face Mm. so it looks like it's part of the background and it's just a portrait of him like Mm -hmm. a profile so it's sideways and then it has this clock right here i'm like that's amazing that's an incredible tattoo yeah well that painting you did would be no because we we both like greek stuff because we're going to be like Oh, since Kevin's letting us do a, a veteran theme thing, it's like it has to be something we, me and Jake both like. Yeah, we both, yeah. Like, we both love Greek shit. Yeah, like, and, it's all the and like, it's all he, ha- he has a Greek god on his upper arm. Yeah, well, it's actually a cover. It's a good cover up. A yeah, really good because it was a Taurus like reaching up with a noose around its arm with a skull on its hand. Mm-hmm. Just some epic shit, you know. <laughs> I was like, it's not very. It's, it's kind of weird being in the astrophysics emphasis with an astrology piece on my arm. Yeah. You know, like. It's kind of weird. So I had it covered up with, uh, he, he's like, I can make this into like a Zeus or something. I was like, fuck yeah, let's do that. You yeah. know? So like, cause it was like, I like Greek stuff, you know? Um, I, man, if I ever commission a piece from you, it's going to be, oh, well, that's if I don't get it as a tattoo. Cause I'm still like, I'm getting older and it's kind of immature if I do it. No, it's I not. still want it no. somewhere. That zombie Pope one. Oh yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking I know about. talking about an episode, but it's the zombie. I, I was coming, I was on mid tour leave in Afghanistan and right, it was like around that time. I think I was actually at Fort Worth and there was this time magazine with the Pope on the front of it. He's like old and dead, you know? And I was like, I want like a zombie Pope with like in one hand, he has the world. In the other hand, he has his rosary beads hanging down with the cross on it and like a nun impaled on the cross. (laughs) 
that'd be such a cool painting he, he mentioned that when we were talking about a painting from you yeah and it was like where it's like black and white it was just like subtle color black and white but just enough color where the color brings out meaning you know what yeah I mean? the colors in certain areas where it's like kind of like that exactly there's color where it's it needs to be to bring something out to you know invoke like an emotion or a response right so that, that'd be like my go-to if i don't get that as a tattoo like okay that's yeah. gonna be my cannabis for I, sure i originally <laughs> told her i wanted a, a hulk an incredible hulk uh-huh because you post i think you posted one or something yeah, no i had asked questions yeah i yeah. love interacting with people yeah. it's like what do you want to see yeah you know because sometimes i i honestly don't know i just know i want to paint but i'm like what do I want to paint? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, some sometimes I know the feeling before I know the subject. Yep. You know, um, yeah. So uh, in that art journey, uh, COVID's actually been one of the times where I've um, created the most, mm -hmm. and it's I've been really fortunate to sign. Uh, I signed with Mercer Street Arts, which they're a gallery in the Hill Country, and they've been incredible partners. But I, I mean. A year ago, I can't imagine that I would be where I'm at right now. Like I just didn't, um, maybe I didn't think I was good enough mm. for it. Yeah. I'm starting to kind of find my stride with it. And I love hearing like other people's take of what they would do or what they want yeah. to see. And often I'll post like, tell me what you want to see. A lot of the times I'm drawn to things that are really primal. Mm hmm like, I love that feeling. Yeah. Um, and most of the time I find with artists is we're always trying to um, create something that we long for, you know? So uh, for me, like all of my animals, if you look at my animals, there's always really strong eyes and there's like a presence about them. Like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna fuck you up or I'm mm -hmm. gonna eat you. Um, you know, with the Thanos, like you could tell his feeling. Oh yeah. Like, that one got me. It was I, huge too. How, what was yeah. the size of it? Uh, it's four feet by three feet. Wow. Yeah. Cause I, I think you had posted a video or there's like a time lapse or something. I'm like, holy shit. Like seeing you in front of it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, damn. Like, cause I didn't, I've, I saw multiple pictures of you doing it throughout and you can't tell the size obviously. And then when he put you in front of it, I'm like, holy shit. And he yeah, needed so to be cool. big. Yeah, hell yeah. He needed to be big. Like, I'm like, I kind of want him to feel like he fills this room because that's who he was as a character. Mm -hmm. And I, I love him as a character because you can tell that he had good intentions. Yeah. He just fucked it up. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he's one of my favorite characters in like all of that Marvel universe. He's still pretty human. There's something really human about him. Like when he's sitting down and he's kind of reflecting on mm -hmm. things, like I'm like, that was brilliant, you know? And in that painting, it's like this grit of um, achievement. Yeah. Ugh. And that they got so. Josh Bridges. I love Josh Bridges. Or not Josh Bridges. <laughs> what did Josh Bridges is a cro crossfitter? Crossfitter. Like, uh, I met him in person once. Oh really? I was thinking like really little. I was yeah. thinking Jeff, <laughs> Five, seven. Jeff Bridges, yeah. but no, uh, Josh Brolin. Oh, Josh Brolin to yeah. play uh, Thanos. I love Josh Brolin. Yeah, he's one of my favorite actors. Yeah. I love in Deadpool too, all the little things that Ryan Reynolds puts in there that have to do with Josh Brolin. Oh yeah, like the scene <laughs> where he's like shirt cocking it, and like the that shirt he's wearing is the one that the fat kid is wearing in the Goonies, mm -hmm. and like there's lots of references Which to the Josh Goonies. Brolin. And uh, other Josh Bowen things that people like, if you slow it down, you'll notice. It's yeah. really funny. Um, but no, uh, I was just about that the other day because I cannot even draw a stick figure. Like that part of my brain just won't work because I've always loved art. My dad's the same way. He was always fascinated. He, when uh, like in the early 70s, he went, he took art classes at BSU. And the most art I ever got was with a stencil, like in sight, when you do your, your uh, rain sketches in cypress school, like drawing trees and buildings, but you had a straight edge. So everything became straight, you know, mm -hmm. but it's something I've always loved. And I just can't just like, it's like, I'm, I'm retarded when it comes trying to do it because I appreciate it so much. And for me, like my role, like playing music, like it's seeing great album artwork, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there's certain bands where, you know, they've got it going when you see the album art and you realize that album, even if they have like five albums, that one is really good. You know, it's just like, it adds to it. Yeah. There's people, a lot of people just look right over the album artwork. But like, I love it. That's one of my favorite things. Yeah. That's what I miss. I mean, I love 
Spotify. <laughs> um, I sent, I had sent him a song because it had all this wonderful percussion in. I'm like, it's on Spotify. I don't think he know. <laughs> right, it still think He can hear it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah you okay. can. I think on Spotify, if you don't pay, you can listen to like. A certain amount of songs it's or like something? a teaser yeah uh, yeah so there was one in. song i was actually going to send you i forgot the other day when i was showing you the, uh the picture of my my uh, long gun with the suppressor on it a song called canvas by so it's like a swedish metal band they're kind of like tool um oh but, i have them on my list oh, okay yeah so the song called canvas i'll see about you because it's yeah. called canvas yeah, yeah. But that album art on that album too. It's like that skull with like the gears in it and like the the, the paintbrush and everything. And I was like, oh man, that's perfect. Mm. That's kind of a cool idea because it's black on white. You know what I mean? Love love that. Yeah, I used to look at um, albums all the time. It's like wine. I used to buy wine by the label. I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Actually, just last night, he sends me a picture of this wine bottle and it has like a bunch of like uh, Day of the Dead style skulls and stuff. Uh -huh. And he says you think Joanna would like this, which is my wife for you listening. He's like, wait, or is that racist? Because <laughs> my wife is Mexican. Right. And I showed her, I'm like, Kevin wants to know if he's racist. And she's like, yes, tell him he's racist. <laughs> and she's like, she's like, but by the way, I do like that yeah. wine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but going off the label of wine, I've done that too, or even oh, beers. Yeah. It's like, like Juggernaut, it's actually not that good. It's like 20 to one for a $21 bottle of wine. I'd buy it for 10 bucks, but I buy it because I love the image on Juggernaut. It's just... It's awesome. You I know, do that with them. like like uh, craft beers and stuff. If they have like a cool logo on the can, I'm like, I'll try it. Yeah, I'm not a big wine drinker. We so. see things by imagery and certain colors and certain palettes, and we not everybody, but I'd say I'd say a majority of us. Well, There's also people I've met that don't don't listen to music, and I'm like, yeah, what the fuck is I've wrong? I've never with you? understood that. Oh, no. I can't. That I spend most of my day listening to music. Me yeah, too. and I don't I don't have that gene in me, but I have a great appreciation for it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and um. No, I, I love music. That's one of my, I grew up around it. That was mm -hmm. one of our like happy family times. I remember my mom and my dad dancing, you know, um, and men dance, you know, mm -hmm. like, so to watch them, it was always that they always had a connection with salsa and um, they would dance together. And I just remember that was like a good memory, but a lot of it is I started having this love for like percussion and um because that's really what carries like our style of music mm -hmm. um and now it's one of those things that i appreciate you know like that's why i like i try to put a lot of videos to music so i feel like it just I, enhances I it you know um like it creates a little bit of an experience so i love when art comes together or when design comes together and kind of like elevates it everything elevates yeah, you definitely have an, yeah. an ear for music Love because it. of your videos. When you do, it seems like the song always fits perfect with whatever you're doing. Yeah. And that's something, like I said, I've never been an artist. I've also never been musically inclined, but I do have an ear for good I, I fucking love music. I'm like, I will talk about music all day with people. Yeah. And I've noticed with your videos. Yeah. It's like that song matches exactly with what you're doing. It's, and sometimes it's by accident. Oh, it's again, it gives a feeling to it. Like you were yeah. saying, it, just, it makes you feel. And like I was saying, I didn't have that appreciation for art until I got a little older. And now, like when I see you post something, like, it gives me this warm feeling. I don't know. It's hard to explain. Yeah. Well, and it, for me, because a lot of my stuff happens online, I try to um, make a connection. It's very hard to make a connection online because it's everyone's you know, we only post what we do well, mm -hmm. usually. So there's already a sense of like, um, it's not reality. It's not like you're not really seeing someone struggle. So for me, it's like, how do I make this very, um, like where you can almost taste it and feel it and where it becomes something that you kind of get pulled into. And for me, that music is the bridge for that. Mm. And often when I work with a client, I'm like, send me some of your songs. Like I'll, I'll paint to them, you know, like send me a playlist. I, I booked a painting that way. I'm like, that was the way that, um, that client connected was specifically with music. And I'm like, make a playlist and I'll paint to it. Mm -hmm. And I, I booked that commission piece specifically. Cause it was like, I'm going to meet you where you're at. That's what you're, that's what you really are passionate about. And so how do we increase that? Like, how mm -hmm. do we make that more of an experience? Um, yeah, there was a, 
a canine portrait that I did that um, I asked the owner, like, send me five of your songs that when you listen to it, like it reminds you of your, reminds you of your, um, of your dog. And uh, he sent me five. And for, for whatever reason, like I skipped over four of the songs, didn't even look into them and picked the one that like stood out to me, which was a song by thrice. It was um, in the pines. I think it's the name of song. it. Oh, yeah. I love that song. And I like immediately was like, that's just a song I'm going to paint to it and come to find out when he lost his dog, when his dog passed, um, that's a song that he would sit and listen to, mm. <laughs> you know? So it was like a beautiful um, accident. Yeah. But yeah, with my art, like I've, um, I started working really early. I've worked since I was 15 until I, I had kids. And then, um, I put myself through a little bit of college. So I've have one drawing course under my belt, but that's it. I did have, I think I posted a piece of like that little piece of chalk that I still have. Yeah. Yeah. That chalk is from my college drawing course. It's the only thing that I really have from that course, um, and that, that was like a moment for me because I was offered a uh, part of a scholarship to go to the Dallas Art Institute, which that was like what I wanted mm. at a high school, like in my senior year, that's what I wanted. And um, my parents at the time, like there's a lot of grace here when I say this, but they're like, fuck that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're not going we're, like they didn't even come to the interview. So I lost that scholarship, lost the because they had to be there to prove it. And I've taken that moment and it's like, okay, well, I didn't get to do that, but I've been able to, to still find a way to make this my voice, you know, and I still carry that piece of chalk with me. Anytime I start a painting, mm. I, I guess that's part of the process too. I don't talk about it often when I start a, a painting, like there's primer that's involved because, um, with, especially with wood, that's wood. Mm -hmm. Um, it'll soak in the paints differently. So I primer it in black and then I I'll paint it in black and then I'll go and start drawing everything out in chalk just cause I can wipe it off while I'm, while I'm doing that. But like that, I wouldn't have learned that in school. Like, yeah. so it's good that it, there's some good things that came out of um, just the trial by air, mm -hmm. you know? Um, cause that really is what works for me. Uh, I painted at the art gallery a few weeks ago and, People just stopping and coming and seeing my process and appreciating it. That was huge for me. Yeah. Um, Cause it's really specific to me. It's not, there's artwork that's out there, but it's not like, I don't know. I just feel like I finally found my voice with it. I, I agree. Like I said, your, your shit is so unique. Yeah. And that's the stuff I like, I don't, maybe it's like a, a little man complex, but I, cause I don't like, disingenuous people i talk about it all the time overstate mm -hmm. it and i don't like that crowd of people that are like <sighs> enamored by like oh this is a five hundred thousand dollar piece by so and so and it looks like garbage like, i don't fucking relate to it like i can't relate to your painting and now someone who buys that has no eye for art they're mm -hmm. buying it for status right mm -hmm. i don't appreciate though that those works of art at all whatsoever you know um i appreciate the person behind it when they're actually doing it for a reason like look at michelangelo's stuff uh, michelangelo's stuff yeah he was commissioned but he was gonna do shit like that no matter what mm -hmm. he was given free reign and like here's what you can do is you can work with unlimited funds go for it right and he did great things but he was gonna do it anyway it was already inside of him he wasn't doing it for that purpose just like any real artist isn't you know i feel so like kind of like back we were saying earlier, it's like, this isn't to make huge profits. I'm going to do this regardless. So I might as well share it with other people Yeah, and help me out in my way of life that way. Cause if you did it for free, you're just going to get burnt out. So especially if you're doing too many commissions, I'd imagine it's like, I kind of want me to be a part of this. I, mean, I want my, you know, if, if something like a song or part of a movie or something, someone says that you see in public, you know, inspires you to do something. It's like, well, I'm going to roll with it anyway. If someone wants to buy this, that's cool, but I'm going to mm. do it for me, you know? Um, sorry, I was long winded kind of around, but you know, I'm trying to say like, I appreciate that Yeah. versus the bougie white people who were like, 
out these art galleries buying huge pieces that look like garbage, you know? Well, one of my hardest experiences was just trying to go into a gallery to, to be like, what do you, how do I start this? Cause a lot of the times yeah. they won't give you the time. They're like, oh, okay. Yeah. You paint. It's like, no, look at my stuff. Mm. Uh, I have a voice. I, I, I'm finding this rhythm and um, I'm not going to say the name of the gallery, but it's one of those where I walked in, it's a $15,000 piece on the wall. And I start asking like, how do you do your commissions? It's well, it's 50, 50, but then the artist has to cover some type of framing and this, you know, so you start losing its price at high because they have like one piece on the wall. It's, um, my gallery that I work with is not like that. They are so, they have been giant mentors and, um, but they also see that I work hard. I approach it like I approached my work with Lexus, you know, it's, there's a system. And, um, for me, it's like, I want my clients to really, um, to feel a part of it. I want them to connect with it. I, I mean, what's the point of doing that? What's the point of spending time there? If it's not, um, if they're not going to have that connection. Yeah. They're just taking a piece of you, you know, it's like, yeah. Plus it's an honor to be in someone's home Yeah. and yeah. people take that for granted. I don't, I, I, I really, that's one of my big things. It's like when you're bringing a painting that I, I worked really hard on into your, into your home. Like for me, it's, it's an honor for it to be there. I feel like homes are sacred, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't, I don't let just whatever come into my house, mm -hmm. um, down to st stuff like artwork, you know? Yeah. And I'm intentional about, um, the artists that I do like, or it's like, if I travel, I want a little piece of art from wherever I travel, mm -hmm. you know, like today on the trails today, I was like, Oh, look, a pine cone. I can paint this with the kids and become <laughs> art. Um, yeah. but they're like these tiny little pine cones and, you know, so anything can be art, anything, anything can be, um, in the lens of creativity. It's just, you have to have a, a solid attitude about it. And for me, it was like, okay, once I started finding my voice and like my animals really brought that out. If you look at my animals, you can see like they just get stronger and stronger. And I always start with the eyes because I feel like if I get the eyes right, everything else will come together. Mm -hmm. um, and the gallery noticed that about me where I couldn't, I couldn't get in anywhere else, but they happen to be the perfect match for me because they've mentored me. It's like, when you sell a painting, this is how we're going to do it. Mm. You know, um, if I commission something from them, uh, you know, I'm honest with them. If I meet a client there and they end up commissioning away from the gallery, it's like, no, you got to go through the gallery. Like we talked there. So my Instagram stuff is separate. And I think I said it last night, the day that Instagram doesn't exist Mm -hmm. in my life anymore. I still have my art. Mm -hmm. The only reason I've kept it up and still keep it going is because it's an experience. It gives you a little bit of a break, just like a little mental cleanse, you know, and I get something out of that too, mm -hmm. uh, out of creating that experience. And, um, so I've, lately I've been more art focused, you know, not necessarily like, this is what I'm doing today. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm just letting the art speak for itself. Cause that's a season of life that I'm in. It feels more genuine to me. Um, but I don't know, like this, like this trip, this was a bucket list thing for me to do because mm -hmm. I get to meet Paul tomorrow and deliver his painting in person. And he's been such a great client. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, the client experience was there, which is something I've learned really early on professionally with, with Lexus. It's like, it's really about that connection because people are going to come back to you if they have a good experience. Even my people that I've given paintings to, I treat them like they're paying me, mm -hmm. you know, give me your, oh, sorry, give me your music. Give me what your, um, get, send me your photos. Mm -hmm. You know, when I ask for reference photos, I'm like, there's not, no such thing as too many photos. That's exactly what you told me. Because yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, it's like from there, I'll pick out like one or two that are similar or that have a certain stance, you know, mm -hmm. um, or have a certain feeling. And then I just start narrowing it down from there, especially if I'm doing a commission piece, like a lot of the artists, 
Um, I understand a lot of the artists that are also work with my gallery don't like to do commission pieces because you have to meet someone else's expectation. Mm. But I feel like I have the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then it only refines me and it only grows that it only grows that experience for me. You know, it's so like with Paul, he had great feedback. Like I've had some that I'm like, oh God, I feel like I'm writing them too much, but I really need direction. Or if I'm building out someone's gun, they know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So it, I need to understand like, this is the model. This is what's on there. This is why it's meaningful. This is how it's used, you know, or, um, someone's, uh, pet for, to me, that's like a family member mm -hmm. still needs to look like their pet. Give me as many reference photos as you want. And mm -hmm. then, or what was a the memory there? And then we just kind of trickle down and work, work that way. So I do that with like any pieces that have been for a fundraiser or that have been given, right? It's like, how much, how many little thoughtful things can I get into that painting, mm -hmm. you know? And then for my stuff, I have really have to reference lighting. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember you asked me, what kind of lighting do you guys have in there? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And you, I almost felt like I wasn't giving you enough because you were asking, you'd like send me like a picture of what you had done so far. And I'm like, it looks perfect. Like I, I was so happy with what you were doing. But I felt like I wasn't giving you it like any because there was no critique for me. I'm like, God, it's perfect. Yeah. It's well, I mean, but that's still that's still information, right? It's like, yeah. okay, he feels like I'm going in the right direction. I just hope like there's I'm not sure that it's happened. I'm sure there's people that like, I don't want to say anything. So I'm gonna say it looks fine. And then they're not happy with it at the end. Oh, that's my biggest pet peeve. Yeah, I'm I bet it is. Oh, I'm like, tell me because I want to fix it. Yeah. Or I, I want to meet your expectation. I really do mm -hmm. because I get so much joy out of like me reaching that goal, mm -hmm. you know? So a good example was Paul. I'm like, walk through this with me. Like where, where, you know, Jill's face, like I'm <laughs> tell me if I'm missing something because the last thing I want to do is show up here with a painting. That's not quite there yet. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, and I do that with, with all my stuff. And there's some things where I've noticed my, the perspective. Yeah, I do better when it's like really close up, mm, okay. you know, um, when there's not like the goat that I was painting, shooting the gun, it's like right here. Mm -hmm. Cause I want it to be right here. You know, I want it to be really in your face and to where you're like, what is happening there? Um, but the lighting is good. Yeah. So it gives you a little bit of a story, you know, well, plus, uh, you, plus you have that room for detail. If it's too small, things become generic in the background versus the, like I remember looking at it and you have that the, on the action, just how abrasive and the sharp edges on there make it look very, just, I don't know, I'll say masculine, but the way it's brought out, it's like, okay, that would look like crap if it was too far away because mm -hmm. it would just, yeah, it wouldn't, it would just be generic looking. So I, I honestly thought that was, that's really cool. That's close up because you get that detail in the small things you take yeah. for granted looking at the top of the action on a rifle, but you're looking you're like, God, that's cool. I want to buy that. What is that? You know, De yeah. detail yeah. makes yeah. things like even like say tattoos, like the detail in a tattoo is what makes it cool or the detail in the nipple on, on my the favorite painting. nipple the, ever the, the also the nipple. only nipple i've ever painted for you listening and not watching on video <laughs> the painting she did for us which most of you i think have seen you can see the dude's nipple and <laughs> just the detail in that alone is amazing and well it's like the i know where the light's coming from it's coming from the side yeah you know yeah. um but that was funny it and and the thing is is i'm i when I'm not a, being a harsh critic of myself, I'm witty and I'm fun mm -hmm. and I want my art to be, yeah, it's really masculine, but, but it's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, the experience is, is fun. Your art is like the prime example of what we talk about all the time, how like good things come out of darkness. Like there you have it. It's yeah. your background's dark and then you create something so beautiful on top of that dark canvas. That's that's just awesome. Yeah. So like, um, my thing is, um, you have to have it. Yeah. It has to like, for, especially with my stuff, it has to be dark, mm -hmm. um, which really works. And my, it was so funny. I was looking at like analytics and who's my client because I have m men and women that follow me 
and I get feedback from both, but like, who's really engaged? It's like 99% men and like 1% <laughs> female. I'm like, okay. But, but that's my perspective is just a stronger perspective. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like it just naturally draws people or men in because it's um, maybe something that, that uh, like that a guy can be like, oh, I understand that. Mm-hmm. You have the same analytics as we do. Well, yeah, but, <laughs> well, obviously, but like <laughs> we, we, we do have some women that listen, but actually I was just looking at analytics today and the men are like, it's like well, 90% like women something. that like, that like our podcast probably have a strong or independent personality. Like mm-hmm. her and my wife both listen. Right. So, and that kind of relates to your paintings. You're not painting stuff on a white canvas with like, a colorful like rose pattern that says like get to be home <laughs> like that you see at target so girls are going to see this stuff and be like i don't get it like okay move the fuck on like go buy that bullshit from target you know wherever else like this is a different purpose this has meaning yeah and i'm not saying oh, sorry that sounds stupid like oh girls are all stupid that's not what i'm saying but i'm saying on the, a broad spectrum they're not gonna relate with you know, some, a lot of the stuff you've done, the military oriented stuff like that, you know, this isn't all colorful roses and yeah. Hey, life sucks. So let's just turn your frown upside down and pretend it doesn't get a painting and put it in a wall that has some roses and it says good to be home. Live, love, laugh. You know, you, my mom has that. And I'm like, (laughs) take that fucking thing down, mom. (laughs) Like, yeah. Like you have people that follow you, you know, I get, you know, that have had a lot of struggle. That's why they have a lot of vets that follow you mm-hmm. or have the commission pieces from you or like Paul, who's a cop for a long time. Like these aren't just like, you know, you're one of the mill, like, like soft people. They've been through some shit mm-hmm. and yeah. that's why they are that they are. And they respect that design and what you do. So in there, that's what I'm saying. Is I guess it's a long winded compliment of people that like your stuff are people that have seen some shit and have come through that and adapted through that and they respect it. These aren't just like 19 year old girls walking up the street or guys walking up the street, you know, buying art. It just has no meaning to it. Yeah. So, you know, plus I've like one of my dad's friends wrote me, uh, his best friend wrote me and she's like, you've been dealt so many bad cards, but it, if I have that attitude, this is what's changed the season. If I approach it, like I am a fucking victim it never is going to get better. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons that I do art, the, the art style that I do and why I'm drawn to like military and stuff, there is a connection there. I miss my dad. So I, I sometimes I'm like, what would he think was be cool? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and then as far, like, I think with artists, we're always looking for like, how do we express love? you know, and sometimes mine is like really in your face, like, Mm -hmm. um, but there's still, there's still something tangible there. And like, I met a, um, hopefully he'll be a client, but I met someone, um, who was former, I think he was a former Marine at the art gallery. And, um, he's like, your, your stuff that you do. And I'm like, I know it's because there's not a voice Mm. out there. So, and, and it fits me. So, who gives a shit if I'm painting a gun, I'm going to make it how I want to see it, you know, and, yeah. and give that meaning. So that person can have that connection because there's a, I, I always say bridge the gap, which um, I, I say that with a lot of stuff, but there is a gap there in between. It's like, why aren't we more, I don't know. There's like a social thing right now with men to being too masculine, which I'm mm. like, no, yeah, no, we, I, the world needs men to be men. Yes, it does. And there, I think there's a place for, for men that aren't very masculine as well. There is a place for them in the world, well, but the, I, yeah, it's, it's lost. It's, I don't think it's lost, but I think that there's this group of people that thinks it needs to be lost. What's and because they don't, because they don't understand just like a lot of men don't understand what it is to be a woman where women are expected to be. And this is what I just posted yesterday. Everything at once. Like a woman has mm-hmm. to be strong and nurturing and masculine when the man is in there and the man just has to make sure he goes to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, so men are having a hard time. Like I have to do all that too. Well, women have been doing it for a long fucking time. So get your shit together, get off the booze and help your fucking family out. Mm-hmm. And there's no, and cause we've talked about this numerous times, like the history of 
since you know uh, civil war then into uh, the industrial age and into the times of prohibition world war one world war two so guys drink their feelings down and then their kids they busted their asses at the same time and they were working so the kids had a lot mm-hmm. in the 50s and 60s and they just thought oh that's how dad asked he's disconnected with the family he drinks a lot he beats us when we do anything out of line so then you have a bunch of men raised that way but they didn't live that life he had to in the wars mm-hmm. right and so now these kids grew up today shit's easy if you don't think it's easy well do you have a fucking netflix account if you can spend 10 dollars a month on yeah. that it's easy right but they're like oh so masculinity is being emotionally cut off no it's not masculinity is actually a photo i just saw this instagram page called photographing war it's a very well done page um and when they posted like two days ago was a guy in World War II and on the island, fighting the islands is a Marine pulling this baby that must have been a couple months old out of debris from this firefighter bombing and it's barely alive. He's carrying it and he's like, okay, he's a masculine as it gets. He probably just shot somebody in the face and he values saving this life. Mm-hmm. Right? It's the tough and tender yeah. aspect. And I have a lot of that in me. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it, it felt it, like I was eating it, it earlier. It, it <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I can still hear you, but okay, cool. So, um, the tough and tender thing. There's something really uh, strong there, and there's something that I I always look for, you know. And I I don't know. I don't know how much of that was because I I was not raised in a tender home. It was tough. It was there was a lot of struggle. Um, but when I see that in a man, I mean, I see it in women, I see it in myself. There's certain things that I've had, like those moments where I can go back to and be like, wow, I really did that shit. Like Mm -hmm. I I did that. Um, but when it's shamed, I have a problem with it because I'm like, there's nothing wrong with it. I I embrace it more. Mm -hmm. I think I have a joke that it's like, I probably should have been a man because I have a different personality as far <laughs> as I'm really drawn to masculine stuff. Oh, I don't want to interrupt you, but I was going to say, because as much as we've talked, I've like, I've told my wife, I'm like, it's like talking to one of the dudes because, yeah, because like, you'll call me bro and stuff <laughs> like that, which you are very similar to my wife. She is just like that. Yeah. I think that's why we've hit it off the way we have, because you guys are very similar. And me and her have hit it up. Yeah, yes, you have, which I was so glad because yeah. my wife doesn't get along with many women, as you might understand. But you guys are pretty similar. I could see that being your case as well. I don't know if it is, but I could see that. And a lot of women are intimidated by her. And it's the weirdest damn thing. Like she'll make some friends, but if something goes wrong anywhere, like even if it's like say I have a friend and they have a wife and her and my my wife get along if something goes wrong somewhere with my friend and their significant other, their wife will block my wife on everything and all this. And it's like, what the hell did she do? Yeah. And she's thinking, what did I do? But I don't have that in me. It's well, and it's, it's weird. Cause like, I don't know. I kind of went on a tangent here, but the way you interact like with me and it's very similar to her, but I, I respect that because it's, I don't know I'm trying to get there's not too much of a facade you know like I I feel like that's really how I talk that's how Mm. I grew up you know I tend to be loose mouthed which rubs some people wrong and I I, it's not that I mean to Mm -hmm. but it's It's just who you are it's just more genuine yeah you know I, I I feel so constricted like we were talking and my customer service voice is so much different yeah than my actual voice like even the octave goes higher because I feel like people are like, why is she so bitchy? But it's not that I am. (laughs) It's just that I I don't, I don't know the, the frill of things. There's like, I don't, I don't like the prettiness of stuff. Mm -hmm. I like grit. Yeah. Um, I'm drawn to a lot of stuff. That's like rough. Me too. Me too. The best customer service service I've ever had from women, whether it's like, you know, returning items or it's at a store in person were the ones who were just had a genuine conversation back and forth and the ones who are always like like the high super high inflection like trying to be as professional as i can Mm -hmm. do the worst job of doing their job yeah it's like you don't need to put that facade on i just want to see that you or can be a competent person you know or be you know respectful whatever you know like i'm an asshole but i come off as an asshole or intense 
but everybody knows like I would never fuck anybody over or do anything negative towards somebody, mm-hmm. you know, unless they had it coming. Right. Yeah. Um, but, and so that's something a lot of people don't get at face value. You well, know? me and you have had this conversation. I've, I've told you like, you're a genuinely good person and you, you do have a rough exterior, especially to people that you don't know, but it's also cause you're like a in shape dude with tattoos and all that good stuff, but you're a genuinely nice I'm basically person. wearing a pink shirt. But I think anybody who's is been, it pink or salmon? I'm colorblind. <laughs> I don't know. Like I didn't. Yeah, the front <laughs> front door on his house is salmon. It is. <laughs> but no, like I think anybody who's been listening to us long enough know like kind of what we're both about, and they know yeah. that you're a good dude, even if you say some shit that might piss somebody off. Sometimes it's like, quit listening. Yeah. I mean, everyone's gonna you. say something at some point that's yeah. gonna piss. Right. Sometimes off. when you say something that's opinionated, it's because of experience. Mm-hmm. You know, you yeah. those. The neuroplasticis, what is that? Those connections in your brain through new experience, which everyone should do. It keeps you younger. You know, if you work at the same job at Burger King for 20 years and don't travel or meet new people, you're probably going to age really fast, you know? So by doing those experiences, it also makes you a little more opinionated sometimes. Yeah. Because you see things other people don't see, you know? Like you have a whole different perspective, you know? Someone that's never left fucking Kansas is going to see something shit different than we see it growing mm-hmm. up around mountains you know well, what I mean? this is the same shit we, we were actually talking about a couple episodes with i think with butch and when you grow up in a place like boise it was always such a small place and it's not like that anymore but because we still live here we still look at it as a small town yeah, yeah. and it's like weird like you think of somebody who lives in say la for instance you're gonna piss somebody off one day but you may probably never see them again because there's so many fucking people growing up here it was like you piss somebody off you're gonna see them again tomorrow and they're still going to be mad at you. And they're going to egg your bike, dude. <laughs> yeah. Well, and do, doing this podcast, like in the beginning, I worried a lot about what we were saying on here. Because I'm like, fuck, if someone hears it, and then they're not going to like me. Oh, no. Yeah, I didn't. Because it's like, you can't sell someone a piece of shit car <clears throat> and then turn it on, but tell them it's fucking, it's a Rolls Royce. Yeah. So it's like, you're, you got to see what you're going to get right off the yeah. bat. Well, and I think, you know, I've gotten better. We both gotten better at, at not giving a fuck what people think listening to this. Because it's like just be ourselves and the people that want to listen are going to listen yeah. and it's going to attract the people we want it to well, attract plus we like i don't listen to a lot of podcasts because if i do i'm doing physics homework i i can't fucking do it yeah i'm not yeah. a kinesiology major i can't just like blow you know half-ass shit but the people i do listen to they're like-minded mm-hmm. you know like if it's andy's tough mike glover joe rogan people like that they're open-minded people but they're passionate and intense about views that they have Mm -hmm. towards good versus bad yeah you know what i mean um and And there's something there with being unapologetic Mm -hmm. with your you know with your point of view Mm -hmm. yeah which i'm learning i'm learning that much later in life it's like don't apologize for being fucking human yeah you know like just keep trying to do better Mm -hmm. okay you made a mistake what is that going to look like in a year from now is that mistake going to matter or is it going to shape me and do something that um, maybe I wouldn't have mm-hmm. done? Yeah. So perspective, that's a, I don't know. For me, it's like the, the art, it's going to speak for itself. The experience is there. It's just, do you want to be a part of it or not? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And offering that. And you can't force anybody and you can't carve a spilt milk. You know, someone doesn't like you for your art or your views that's cool because there's plenty of enlightened people out there that do. Mm -hmm. So don't get hung up and ruminate on people that see things different. Well, That's like, I was just talking about caring what people thought about this in the beginning. It's like, actually there's a lot of people that don't care what we say that enjoy us. And it's like, I'm going to roll with those people. And including like my own parents who have never listened to this that I know of. Thank God. Yeah. Like, I don't want them listening to this. No. And actually yesterday, mother's day was yesterday. I went over to my folks house and, my dad starts asking me, so how do I listen? I'm like, uh, and I'm What's like, the YouTubes. Well, and I told him, I told him, I'm like, you have to have like a podcast app. And he's like, oh shit, I don't even know how to do that. Which he just got like a smartphone a year ago, I think. Well, wow. but it's like, I, I don't want people really close to me to listen to this. I mean, the closest person in my world, my wife listens. And at first I'm like, I don't want you listening. Like, what if I say something stupid, but she's used to me saying stupid stuff. So, and now she listens to every episode. Yeah. which is still kind of weird to me that she's listening the big thing is like i don't want my kids listening yet i want them to go back to this later in life and listen well you're leaving you're gonna leave like good memories yeah and I mean, we've talked about this we have now already hours and hours of us just 
talking Mm -hmm. and our kids one day can go back and hear that. My older son, I think has been listening and he says he's not. And they're going to be like, man, people used to use gas around lawnmowers. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. You hear that in the background probably, (laughs) but no, like it's, it's a weird thing because there is shit I say on here. It's like, I don't want my kids to hear that at the age they're at. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I think my 13 year old has been listening. My mom was like, send me your podcast, mommy. And I'm like, (laughs) no. Not today, game game. No. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it is weird, like, knowing that there's people out there that that know you and they're listening. Like, you're on here now. They're going to go and listen to this because you were on here. And then you're going to be thinking, like, oh, shit, did I say anything about them or whatever? And it's Or just because we say dumb stuff, <clears throat> is that going to affiliate you in a bad way, you know? Yeah. Like, someone you want on here and then they're like, well, those guys are jackasses and she seems <laughs> to like them. So, I'm like, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it goes back to, like, not caring what people think. And there's a lot of people in my life that whether it's at work or whatever that have ended up listening to this all the time mm-hmm. and they give me compliments on all, all the time. That's nice. So well, the people that the people that are going to be in your life is because they appreciate it mm-hmm. or they appreciate that you're trying, Yeah. you know? Um, and then you don't have to hold space for anyone that doesn't. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not a fake person anyways. Like I'm just myself. I, I will like last night at dinner, you, I probably cut you off 800 times. When I, I, I think we do that to each other. And <laughs> I have done, I've done that my whole life and I, I'm trying to get better about it, especially on here. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to sit back and like, let the guests talk. Cause I get this mode in my brain where I'm like, okay, I, I think of something to say. And I'm like, I got to say it or I'm going to forget. Or I'm going to forget. That's a really nice watch. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I've been like that my whole life. And I, I think I've gotten a little better at it during the podcast, like not cutting people off. But at last night at dinner, like actually we were talking about that before you got here today. Kevin's like, oh yeah, you just cut her off like you did last. I'm like, oh fuck, I did. I didn't even notice it. Son of a bitch. <laughs> and Joanna's like, oh, that's him, you know, and it is me. But like, I'm not a fake person. So people that know me in my real life, if they go listen to this, it's, there's no difference. Yeah. That's just who I am. But see, I don't have anybody that actually listens. Oh, Joey. Uh, Joey. We, we have, I give credit. To there's Joey. people we both know that I know listen to this. Really? Oh yeah. yeah. No, I, my wife didn't like, she never supported me. Well, yeah, boo. Um, <laughs> um, but like no, I would try to get some friends like, hey, check it out. Um, they never do. But when it comes to family, I'm. It's weird because we don't I'm not really as self conscious. But when it comes to family, I am. Like I don't want my parents listening or anybody who's a family member. Yeah, same. And I told my cousin about it a few weeks ago. I was like, oh, you know, you had a podcast. It's like I was keeping it that way. Dude, it was weird to me. We have. <laughs> and then I think he did listen. The neighbor on that side. One day I was out here. I had both the doors open on this, and I was yeah. cleaning it. He's like, oh, what's that? And I had told him about, I was starting a podcast. And I don't know my neighbor that well. Really nice guy. And I was like, oh, that's our studio. He's like, oh, man, that looks really good. And I'll check it out. I'm like, oh, I don't, which I don't ever talk about my neighbor. But it's like, I don't know if I want my next door neighbor listening to me. Because we, we get kind of personal on here sometimes. But it's also, we do want more people to listen. So it's good. Maybe my next door neighbor, next door neighbor will listen. Yeah. So I talk so much shit about him watering on the wrong days. <laughs> You're not supposed to water on Sunday, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> You motherfucker. Oh, I wish your other fucking neighbor would listen. Rob. I want oh, yeah. to come on. There's do you know who Rob Oberst is? Mm-mm. He's a one of the strong strong men dudes. He's from Texas, yeah. No, but he's one of the world's strongest men, guys. Well, he bought a house in the neighborhood. And the guy is fucking giant. I don't even know if he'd fit in here, but he's huge. And I keep telling Kevin, like, go tell, go be friends with him. I want him to come on. I know. Because he 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 runs in the same circles as all these military guys. Like, yeah. He's been he was actually just at that black rifle. Thing the, they did like the veteran shoot thing they did oh that, they had a fundraiser yeah. didn't they yeah they do a lot for for, yeah. for everybody but yeah he was at that thing but he's actually i found out first found out about him because he was with uh uh west whitlock do you know who west whitlock is no he's in austin too i mean i recognize that rogue name. american apparel i am the worst with names but you show me his face and i'm like I, I've noticed, I know that person well i've noticed <laughs> you're, you're kind of involved in the veteran world so i thought you might know because he has, owns rogue american apparel right no i might and then just don't know his name no anyways. which i'm terrible about that <laughs> mm-hmm. terrible I'm, it's weird i look I look someone straight in the eyes shake their hand for him and like hi i'm kevin and you are you know mm-hmm. jessica and then two days later i'm like what's up dude <laughs> yeah like, I, I dude, just can't. that gets worse as i get older I think you have like a certain amount of space in your brain that you can remember people's names. Cause I, I used to be the guy who would like, I'd meet you one time. I will remember your name. I'll remember details. You told me. Oh, I'll remember de- details. I won't remember your name. All that's gone away for me. And it's yeah. like, I'll meet somebody who I've met and I'm like, Oh shit. Like I know I know them, but I can't remember their name. Maybe there's something with having kids. It's <sighs> like sleep deprivation. It's, it's, 
It's something. Glass that. injuries, you know, whatever. <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, but right. yeah as far as people listening it's yeah. good it's your yeah. creative outlet it's, it's okay to for people to listen i think yeah even if... it, it was weird at first but I'm, I'm used to it now i think like I, I was telling you guys last night about going somewhere and having people come up to me and tell me they listen that i didn't know yeah. these people and I, at first i was like well this is kind of surreal but it's cool because that's what we're trying to do. We want people to fucking listen to this. Oh, man, you know? I was like your champion on that plane because <clears throat> flying right now is so weird. No one talks. Mm. And like the first flight out, I was sitting next to two women. Didn't say a word to me. The second flight, it, I was sitting in between two. Of course, I get put in the middle, which I hate. <laughs> but um, I looked at them and me being really sarcastic. I was like, you just won the middle seat lottery, my friend, because I weigh 100 pounds. I'm not going to take up any of your space. <laughs> and then we ended up talking about the podcast and art and all that stuff. Awesome. And I feel like it's it's good. Um, it's good when creatives come together mm -hmm. and really start doing, they're bringing change or awareness or just having a conversation. You know, most of the time, like I, I think I say it on my Instagram, that tends to be like the one outlet that I get most interaction with. And I'm like, talk to me, mm -hmm. tell me your perspective. You know, like I want to hear your experience. I, I'm like fascinated with podcasts. I love listening to people. Me too. Um, and I have a deep respect for, uh, for people's um, vision, mm -hmm. you know, and experience because I know what I've experienced and that's made a difference for me. And, um, and one of those things is like, how can I use it as a tool to keep growing? Yeah. Not just for myself, but to, for my kids to see that. Mm -hmm. And then for, for them to like cling on to that one day, Yeah. you know, like every now and then I'll have them sit down and draw with me. Or like, if I'm sketching something out, I'm like, okay, I'm going to hold the ruler and you're going to do this because this part of my legacy that I'm going to leave behind. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that both of them are kind of artistic and yeah. creative. And so you'll have this to pass down. Yeah. And yeah. we've, we've talked about that a lot of times because I wish my dad would have sat down and talked on a microphone for hours so I could go. I listen. would do anything for that. Oh, it'd be amazing. And actually, you know, it's funny before you guys got here today, I came out here to start setting stuff up and my little guy comes out here with me and I'm trying to get the camera and all that set up. And he sits in that chair right there and he grabs the mic. He's like, all right, episode 100. <laughs> we have an artist coming on today because he had asked me who was coming over. And I'm like, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's really sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I um, I try to include my kids mm -hmm. often. I don't really like post them too much because I respect that though. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like, I don't know, with the internet, kids are abused often yeah. on the internet or they're used like as a, like, Oh, this is my life. Yes, I yes. hate that. Or you that. have you have these kids who have millions of followers on YouTube, and their it's parents are raking oh, in the money. <laughs> That's why we have private Ryan's accounts. World yeah. on YouTube. Oh, uh, so oh. my my son that was sitting in there today, and he's yeah. obsessed. He has shirts. He has everything yeah. of Ryan, and I feel bad for that little kid because he's going to be fucked yeah. up when he gets older. Like he's, I've said this before, I appreciate that we live in America. Like. You know, if we were in a real war, yeah, I'd fight for it again, you know, if it was a real war. But this is ridiculous that people can make a living, an exceptional living off of this. There's no substance. You don't have to be good at anything. Um, I don't know. I don't see, I don't know. Maybe I'm just stuck in this old fashioned world of like, you know, character and morals and hard work and yeah. busting your ass to do something, not not just being a lazy piece of shit and editing fucking YouTube videos and making millions of dollars it, off of it. It's ridiculous. And like you said, cool that we live in a place you can do that. Yeah, exactly. It's a but dichotomy for sure. I, I, and you know, adults, whatever, but I feel bad for these children who have become like famous yeah. on YouTube and you look at child stars from the past, they always get fucked up. And that little kid who's what, probably seven years old or whatever has millions of kids around the world that know who he is. My own son is, I want to go play with him. It's like, it's not how things work, man. Ryan's a little yeah. dick. Don't play with him. <laughs> he might be. He might be a nice young man. No, but uh, I don't know. It's it like you said with the kids thing. Like I don't post anything about my kids on the podcast, Instagram right. at all. No. We talk about them on here occasionally, but like I rarely say the names of my kids on here because I think of that. I don't want people 
in my personal life my personal instagram page that's all it is is my kids yeah but that shit's private and you gotta yeah, be my, you gotta be like a legit friend of mine to follow me and i'll probably never take it off private and we do we have had people kevin and i both since we started this trying to follow our personal pages people we don't know and it's like sorry but i don't know you i don't want you yeah. all up in my person you get enough yeah. of my personal life on here you know what i mean i so get it instagram is like one of those things that i'm like i don't know yeah. You know, uh, I'll, I'll have to go and like, sometimes I'll clean up who follows me. Cause I'm like, who are you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't want you to see too much, even though I know I'm putting it out there. Ugh. It's, it's a fine line. It's it, weird. Damn yes. it. Right. Yeah. Cause you do want more. You people have to, to have the interaction. Yeah. But as far as the kids, I don't bring them <laughs> on there. Cause I don't want someone to know like my kids names yeah. and be able to come up to them. Same. And, but they are a giant part of my life or mm-hmm. why I tick or why I do the, the things that yeah. I do, you know? Um, well, my kids are everything. I mean, that's. Yeah. But I'm so straightforward with my kids. The way I talk to y'all is the way I don't baby talk. You yeah. know, I'm like, what the fuck is happening <laughs> right now? Yeah. You know? Um, so b- because I want them to know who I really am. Yeah. You know? I agree. And that's that I didn't get that with my parents until much later. Mm-hmm. And that's something I noticed that I wanted to be yeah. really early on as a parent is like, I didn't get to know my dad until the last few years of his life. Mm-hmm. Like we were like oil and water until I, my late twenties. And, you know, um, like really when I became a mom, I saw him differently. I was like, fuck, you did the best that mm-hmm. you could. Yeah. Like, you gain a whole new respect for what your parents. Yes. You know, yeah. and there's a lot of, um, amends there that happened without him ever having to apologize Mm -hmm. like it just naturally was like i forgive him for that stuff like he did the best that he knew how and like now for me i get to enjoy my mom Mm -hmm. in a different way we have a different relationship but the relationship with my dad what changed was he just started respecting me as an adult Mm -hmm. and i don't think a lot of us at like when i say us this kind of age group Mm -hmm some parents really struggle with that with yeah. seeing um their kids as an adult as a spouse as a parent mm-hmm. you know and i was really fortunate to have that with my dad before he passed which is actually part of the reason why i started painting again really yeah i had like my grief needed a place to go yeah well you've told me like that's kind of therapy for you your it's artwork big therapy because yeah. i'm naturally an anxious person i'm an overthinker mm-hmm. Um, that's why I listen to a lot of podcasts because I would much rather be listening to someone else's voice yeah. other than my own yeah. and driving myself crazy. Um, but, you know, uh, and some of the podcasts that I seek out are, it's just because I didn't get those stories. I miss those stories from my dad. Mm-hmm. So now I'm grateful that I have found a place to like plug that in. Like right now, uh, while I was traveling, I'm like, okay, I found an old picture of my dad. I would love to paint something for myself, but I don't know enough of his story. Mm -hmm. I have some stories, Yeah, you know, there was an armadillo involved with the sleeping bag and there was a (laughs) fork through someone's hand and basic. And so like, I have these like stories that he used to say all the time, but I didn't get to know him enough before he Mm -hmm. passed and that, that, you know, um, the art and the podcast and the music and stuff is always, there's still a way that I can connect with that. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's like a generational thing too. Like the generation before us, they were not open with their children about their lives. It just no. wasn't, I, I like you, I'm, I'm pretty open with my kids. They, they know everything about me. Like, uh, when I was younger, I got in some trouble and I ended up going to jail and I ended up saying that to my kids and my wife's like, he's gonna go to school and tell people his dad went to jail you know but i'm like you know i want them to know that shit because i want to know my flaws as well as i don't want them to think i'm superman because i'm fucking not yeah and i I, and kevin's the same with his kids he's he talks to them just like he talks to me and i think that's an important quality and i think that's something that wasn't in the generations before us no like my kids my kids see me happy they see me sad Mm -hmm. my big thing is that they don't carry my feelings for me Mm. so i'll tell them like Hey, mom's sad today and I'm going to cry and you don't have to fix it, but I'll take a hug if you want to give mm-hmm. me a hug or I'm going to paint because I'm a little anxious, mm-hmm. you know, because um, I have panic. I'll, I'll have like full out panic attacks, which 
are very um, few. I've been like last two years, I've really have tried to tackle like, why does that shit happen? You know, and a lot of the times it's, I'm just thinking so far into the future. Mm. And something that makes me really brilliant with my art is I see pictures, vivid pictures Mm. in my head. So usually before I start something, I, it's already in there, yeah. which is a, like a superpower creatively, but it, phew, if that doesn't have a place to go, it really is a thing that hurts me the most. Mm. And that's why you see me always turning out a lot of work. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't care if I have someone that's going to buy it or not, it needs to come out. Yeah. And I, I at least recognize it now that it's a, a, a useful tool working out. It's a great tool. You know, when I, when my dad passed, it was sudden. Um, and then I, like, Asher was six months and colic. So I wasn't sleeping. And I was like handed this like giant sack of shit, you mm-hmm. know, it was like, figure it out, you know, figure it out this state without a will. And you got to, and for me, it's like, if I'm, if he trusted me with that, I need to do it to my fullest extent or, uh, the fullest amount that I can. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and working through that with like a young baby was terrible. Mm-hmm. It was terrible doing anything. Yeah. And it like children. literally paused my grief for a year. Yeah. And there's a giant lion painting. The name of it is Judah. If you go back, that was all me grieving my dad mm. when I finally got to grieve because I honored everyone that needed to be honored in that estate. And I was like, fuck, I took care of that. How you wanted me to take care of it, even though you didn't tell me, yeah. you know, and like maybe accidentally didn't give me the tools, but it had to come out. So the two things I started doing was artwork and working out mm. and it, you know, it's good to have an outlet. Yeah. And then I jumped into like, I'm very open about counseling. I've been in counseling for two years just mm-hmm. for myself. Cause I feel like that's, that's a tool in my tool belt. Mm-hmm. Um, helps me understand my, the way I tick a yeah. little bit more. And then, you know, I have a program that I also work aside from that, that I have a mentor with. Mm-hmm. Um, and those things, it's like, it's only bringing me accountability. It's only bringing me understanding. Like I'm not hiding from it. I'm not hiding things from myself. So it's just another step in like growth. Mm. Yeah. And that's, a, I, I'm not an anxious person, but I do like trip on the future a lot. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll be thinking a million steps ahead and I'm like already freaking out about this and it hasn't even came. I think they say like that's anxiety is where you think about the future depression is where you think about the past. I've heard that before. Oh, mm-hmm. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> that, I mean, it makes sense. And, and like, I've never been a depressive person at all. Like I'm a pretty glass half full type of person. I always have yeah. been, but I, I have some, it, actually Kevin made me wear my anxieties. Like I didn't realize that's what was happening that I was ang- anxious. And Kevin's like, dude, that's fucking anxiety. Cause he knows it. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh fuck. I guess. Sometimes it's stuff you haven't dealt with. It could be like a passing thought. Like, <clears throat> oh, that's something I should have dealt with or really thought mm-hmm. through. And I didn't, I shoved it down, thought I was okay. Yeah. And so you realize your brain's re- reacting to it. Your gut's reacting to it. And you're like, okay so i have to deal with this apparently like just like stresses mm-hmm. like why am i why is my body why is my cortisol going up mm-hmm. something i haven't dealt with i have to yeah. deal with this I, I can't just put it off i can't procrastinate this you know why am i afraid we're afraid because i mean think about the hunter gatherers right i'm afraid because something's saying be careful mm-hmm. i'm afraid of a snake it's because it might be poisonous i need to be careful mm-hmm. i'm afraid of jumping into a new relationship because I have to be careful, mm-hmm. right? So your body, before you even know it, locks up, puts your wall up so that you're not feeling empathy. You have to be apathetic, right? If I have to be careful, I don't have any time for emotions. I only have time for fight or flight. Mm-hmm. Get the fuck out of there or kill something, right? Are you more of like, uh, it's a question I haven't even asked you, are you more anxious person or depressed? Because I know you, you've, you've had both, but depends if i'm tired it goes right into depression yeah you know like at night i just think about being like my grandpa like 91 years old when he died you know like Mm -hmm. i'm just gonna die and it's gonna go into nothing this is all meaningless i'm not a nihilist it's just you're really depressed you're like okay well this is i'll make the best of it while i'm here Mm -hmm. but while i'm here i'm anxious about making enough money and supporting my family you're not really in the moment a lot of the time that's where you start thinking about future and then yeah and then the anxiety 
like I said, like like the time I had had the heart stuff, I was slow pace on a rower. And my heart was barely even up. It was when I got off and I started feeling like I was starving. Like my blood sugar was fucked up. So it's like, maybe I need sugar, maybe I need a banana. It's because my blood sugar was too high. Your cortisol goes up, blood sugar goes up, right? That's why people retain fat when they're stressed. You have yeah. too much sugar in your blood. Next thing you know, I was like, I was like, I thought I was going to pass out. I was breathing so hard. Luckily, I was able to call 911. But I was like, where did that come from? I didn't know. I didn't realize how much shit I was putting off and stuffing down from having no real intimacy in my marriage mm-hmm. and what it was actually doing to me and yeah. suppressing. And because I was trying to deal with that, let's put all my deployment stuff on the back burner. That's not a big deal. Right. Um, and so, cause I never dealt with when she was cheating on me when I was in Afghanistan, I stuffed that way down. I was like, I have to deal with my deployment stuff now, like then mm-hmm. and not deal with it. I was like, I literally just said, here's my coping mechanism. She was young. Women do that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's cool. I resolved it. Just stuff that it's never going to come I back. I thought that was resolved. Me just saying <laughs> to myself, I thought that was resolved, you know? Yeah. They realize, oh, I never had closure on that. I never realized why do I let people do that shit to me? You know, why would I just, you know, not people, but women, you know, because the guys, they don't get away with shit. I call people yeah. out for parking like a fucking idiot. <laughs> but when it's women, for some reason, it's like, is this a Freudian thing? Is that to do with my mother? I was going to say, it's my probably, mother. you were raised by three women. Right. And I was a similar situation. I was raised yeah. by my mom, my sister. Right. So it's so like, yeah. you, yeah, let, you let them get away with more. Which. Yeah. So the anxiety, you realize the anxiety is undealt with and the anxiety and stress are undealt with emotions and problems. You have to sit down and deal with. And if you don't have time to sit down and deal with them because you're working 60 hours a week and taking care of three kids, mm-hmm. then you have to suppress it with alcohol and drugs. And that doesn't end well because your body adapts or your body adapts to those. So you have to do more and more. Next thing you know, we try to quit, your serotonin, your dopamine drop, and then you're having withdrawals, panic attacks, anxiety attacks, you know, then, I mean, it's a, it's a, to a, to a, someone with like a PhD or master's in psychology, this is just like, they'll see it coming because they're mm-hmm. trained yeah. to see these things. We have to try to organically feel it out and see what's happening and why it's happening when they can literally say, oh, this is, this is, you know, one-on-one shit right here, you know? Yeah, well, I think the common person isn't aware of any of that. So that's right. why they don't know what to do when shit starts spinning out of control in their life. Well, if you look at it from an anthropological, you know, study on humans or sociological study on humans and behavior, why do a lot of uneducated people that have kids very, very young get into drugs and are very young, you get hooked quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't even know how to process anything and they haven't been taught. They were probably left alone by themselves a lot by their parents, you know, so you can, kind of quantify a lot of that shit why people behave the way they do and of course there's always outliers because of the social environment whether it's Mm -hmm. growing up as a child star you know uh, being abused these certain things you know emulate their in their own way but for the most part you can kind of see when things are going to happen you know yeah Mm -hmm. and like for for me i was taught at a really early age like you just pack it down Mm -hmm. you're not allowed to have feelings because it was almost a threat if you had a feeling Mm -hmm. in the house, you know, and then it was disciplined. And, um, and for me, I can take like physical pain. I can almost turn off and not feel it, which is crazy. But then like emotional pain, I feel it because Mm. it was so packed down, so disciplined, um, that as an adult, I've, I've needed to understand, okay, you tick this way because you were conditioned, but doesn't mean that's how you have to keep going mm-hmm. forward. Very true. You know, um, so right now it's like at 37, I'm having to undo a lot of that that I didn't even realize existed. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't realize that there was trouble with um, alcohol in my household when I was growing up. You know, my dad was a former army and I think he always saw it that like brotherhood and and not having that, not having that connection drove, drove certain things. Mm -hmm. I saw him chase it until the day he passed, you know? Um, And, but I was raised tough, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not allowed to show your feelings. You can't make eye contact. There's not a lot of like, I love yous. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, well, that doesn't have to continue with my kids. Exactly. You break the cycle. Yeah. And I'm to the place where it's like, okay, you have to look at these things Mm -hmm. because it can't ignore them. I didn't even realize 
how much I was ignoring until a few months ago. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, fuck, that that's there. <laughs> and here it comes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, I feel like I'm dying, yeah. but I'm not. Um, but, you know, for like as a 12 year old, like that was the first time I really thought about taking my life. It's like, what? Where did that come from? Mm-hmm. And it was the environment. Mm-hmm. you know, and, and as an adult, it's like, I can't keep allowing myself to spin mm-hmm. that way. Cause now that I know that it's there, okay, give me some tools to deal with it. It was and the thing that too, is people often don't seek, um, they don't accept responsibility mm-hmm. for making that a different path. Yeah. It's back to the victim thing. Everybody, they want to play. Yeah. Victim. Yeah. See, that's something that I didn't realize. Um, like when I talk about r- being raised that way, uh, it's just the way that I was raised. I no longer feel like it was done to me, you know, and before it was like, like everything was in victimhood. And then I, be- I became this like gross martyr, mm. you know, I'm like, who the fuck are you? Like, that's not, that's not your personality. Like you're fun, you're witty, you're smart, you're creative. Mm-hmm. And it really became like a, a big identity shift. You know, my world got really small when I stopped working. Um, because I had an 11 year career with Lexus and that was always like face to face with people, you know, and then, um, I stopped working to raise, um, to raise my kids. And I didn't realize like I did a big identity shift then. Mm -hmm. And I see that with like former military people, you come out out of this, like, um, fast paced environment and, and you're like, this is so different, you know? And that was, that was that for me when I became a stay at home mom. And then my identity became like, well, I'm a stay at home mom. And then all the social responsibilities that are put on women of what you Mm -hmm. should look like. I am not that, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't want to be that. Yeah. And that's okay too. You know? Yeah. But it's like just finding my pace with it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's like, things like what we're doing now just sitting here talking about your shit is so good for you it's good for everybody to just get it out there and talk even if there's a bunch of people we don't know listening to us talk about it it's it's an important thing i think to to be able and like kevin's gotten a thousand times better about talking about his shit especially his past and even openly to people he doesn't know which didn't used to because i don't perceive being on a podcast as anybody listening yeah i don't know why I didn't until like recently I started like think about God, there's fucking, there's people all over the world listening to this. And that's where it goes back to, you know what? I don't care what they think though. Fuck right. it. I'm just going to keep talking well, about and, what I'm talking about. And part of that is like my inferiority complex. That's why I always did like, for instance, if I go into a store, I imagine like if I walk in and there's people working right there, if you go into a car dealership or something, I honestly feel like everybody doesn't want me here. So fuck them. And I feel like there's like hostility, like people don't want me where I'm at. They don't want to listen to me talk. So why even try? And but it's also done good things because I'm only 5'11", but I was probably the meanest motherfucker in football at our <laughs> high school. And when we wrestled, I was wrestled two weight classes. I also wrestled heavyweights because we didn't really have any. And I'd destroy them because I mean, I had that fight. Like I'm in fear to this person. So I'm going to show them, you know what I mean? So it has its goods too. Yeah. There's also baggage with that. Mm-hmm. feeling like wherever you go you're not wanted and you're like okay let's go back to your mother you're like oh shit <laughs> no damn it like, yeah <laughs> you know like yeah. or your dad you know not being you no know, you know like when dad was around it was you know got a keystone in his hand and all he does his intimacy is you're fucking everything up you're doing everything wrong mm-hmm. why are you fat right now it's because if we're living with just mom we're poor and eat ramen noodles and fucking cookies that's why motherfucker mm-hmm. you know um so yeah there's an explanation and everything yeah. but it's trying to like be an adult and come get over that so that you can be a great person for your kids yeah because even though we want to be vulnerable around our kids like we've all agreed we talked about you know being vulnerable around them if they're scared or fearful you have to step up and be the best version of yourself mm-hmm. and be a very strong mentor for them so they know because they if they have no one to believe in they're going to be terrified and then now what that does is they're going to go when they go to leave for college or then the military, they're going to have such a bad separation anxiety. They're going to fall apart mm-hmm. because they're used to not having that strong character in front of them, guiding them through things. Yeah. I let my right? kids struggle. Yeah. yeah. And that's as hard as that can be. You have oh to. God is so hard. Yeah. You have to though. Sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I'm like 
protector. Sometimes I try to control a little too much, you know, but legitimately I'm like, okay, you live in this house. So you're going to have responsibilities in the house. And there's going to be a little bit of struggle there. Mm -hmm. If you want something, you got to work towards it. You know, for, for me, I've had to realize how much of like my stuff was like deeply rooted with self-worth, you know, or lack of self-worth is probably a better way of saying it. And now that I'm starting to find my voice, but fuck, I'm almost 40 and I'm just getting there. Do you know? So I hope, but at least you're getting there there and I'm willing, you Mm -hmm. know, and I feel like, okay, if that's a change of attitude, it's like, that's, I can do that a little different. My kids can see me struggle through it. I can be honest with them where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And then we just pivot. And if I make a mistake, sometimes my worst mistakes are what I like, I will disappoint myself before I ever disappoint anyone else. Like Mm -hmm. I've already in my head, it's already there, Mm -hmm. you know, usually before it ever happens. Um, And for me, it's like, maybe I can own that a little bit more Mm -hmm. and let, let that mistake, like teach me a lesson. Um, or embrace that a little bit more or make, maybe make different decisions based off of like chance. Mm -hmm. Like it, yeah, it's scary, but it might work. Yeah. It might be better. Or like right now it's like, would I regret not trying? And so many times it's like, fuck yes, I would. Mm -hmm. I would. I don't want to look back at that and say, I really regret not giving that a chance. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the, you know, something I'm quick to do is apologize when apology needs to happen. I've learned that this last season, like I'm going through this like thing is like, uh, I think it's like three, it's three A's. What is it? Awareness, acceptance, and action. Mm. And I know where I'm at right now. It's a shitload of awareness. <laughs> <laughs> as rough as that can yeah, be. Yeah. And yeah. And then acceptance is almost like a pause. And it, it, it's not that everything, it, it's not that it goes like it flows, right? Like I'm having to pause and I'm having to think and I'm having to like not force a solution with a lot of things and just be like, okay, I can try to do something different. Mm-hmm. And if I fail, I fail. And it'll I think that's right. a good, good yeah. way to look at things. Because you, you got to fail anyway. You can't, you can't do anything perfect, yeah. you know? Failures, yeah. failure yourself. And then as long as you're introspective, you look back on it and you're like, okay. Here's how to do this better. Here's how to respond better. Here's how to learn how to respond versus react. Yeah. Like you go real deep in this rabbit hole, like, you know, but it's not bad. As long as when you're failing, you don't just continue to do the same shit over and over and continue to fail. You got to learn. From yeah. It. It's just button your head. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's insanity. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's an important thing is to like, accept like, okay, I fucked up. Why did I fuck up? And how am I not going to fuck up this next time around and move on? Well, all right, let's wrap it up with tell everybody how they can find your beautiful artwork. Um, Okay. I have (laughs) a few ways. I don't do much on Facebook. There's a, there is Facebook, but I, I just let Instagram naturally feed it. So Mm -hmm. it's J Mart works on Facebook and works is spelled with an E. Um on Instagram, it's JM Artworks, spelt with an E, period studio. That's usually where you can find me. I'm most active there. And then I have a website, it's just jmartworks.com. With an E. With an E. Because <laughs> it can't be basic. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So all of you listening, go check out her art. Because yeah. It's oh, and there was amazing. one question. Oh, yeah. You did that I was you did supposed a question. to cover. Yeah. Go for it. Um, what would I tell an artist that was like an inspiring artist or one that's struggling? Um, how would I like motivate them to keep going? And it's like, find your voice. Mm. Don't feel like you have to fit into this like puzzle piece of what, you know, just keep working towards finding your voice. And if you get stuck, you know, do something different and give it a try. Um, for my stuff, if if anyone is interested in starting to paint or art, message me. Mm. I'll tell them like the spies that they need. I'll, you know, Bob Ross is actually a really great Bob Ross reference. The He's yeah. the man. Um, but that's how I learned how to paint and shade, you know. So there's like there's so many references out there. But if you get stuck, I would say just try to take a step in a different direction. 
and don't be too hard on yourself. Perfect. So. All right. Well, go check out her artwork. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for yeah. making the trip all the way this from Texas. So much fun. <laughs> yeah. Now you're going to fall in love with Boise and want to move here. I know. I'm like, oh God, that's what, a little homestead. That's what usually yes. happens <laughs> when people come here, they're, especially if they've never been here and it's their first, they're like, oh my God, I love this city. And then they end up moving. I here. just love there's no humidity. But actually, yeah, right. actually Boise's <laughs> ugly and sucks. So don't fucking move here. Not you, but everybody <laughs> else. Just cool people. All the, only the cool people can move yeah. here. All right, cool. Well, All right, thank thanks. you.